Right, it's the morning after deadline day and uh, we're going to be reflecting on everything that happened in the transfer window and more with uh, our very own Jamie Carragher who joins us live right now. Jamie, absolutely fantastic to see you. But before we talk about the transfer window though, mate, I mean, what was going on at Anfield the other night? 98 minutes, dodgy VAR decisions. I mean, I couldn't believe what I was seeing, man. Pete, I think they're still playing now. <laughs> <laughs> I think Joe Lit I think Joe Litton's gone down with cramp again. <laughs> oh mate, brilliant to see you. What did you make of the of the transfer window? I mean Arthur, I guess, was the big one for Liverpool. They needed a midfielder. Is he the answer for you? Your old teammate Diddy Haman wasn't sure. I, I don't think it, it, it's the answer in terms of what Liverpool will need over the next sort of, you know, three or four years. You know, a bit more, you know, younger energy in there, maybe a different profile of player. I think he's He's in just to fill a space, really. That's the reason why Liverpool have bought him late. That's why he's only on loan. And it, it smacks a little bit of what Liverpool did uh, about 18 months ago when they had lots of centre-backs in the January. They didn't buy anyone. They got a couple of players on loan and it was almost a, you know, have a look at them, really, before you may actually uh, try and buy them. And Liverpool didn't buy those players and then went and bought Canate in the summer. So the actual midfield player that they want is not available right now. So I think bringing someone... In on loan is is very sensible. Mm. Um, Liverpool obviously, Jamie had that record signing this summer for Darwin Nunes. He's almost back available. Has Klopp though been sufficiently backed in this window beyond that huge, huge sum of money for Nunes? Well, I mean, you can look at the, the funds other teams have spent, and at times that does frustrate Liverpool supporters and. and you know, all fans are the same. We all get excited by a transfer, but there's no point buying players that you don't need. Now, Liverpool needed a striker, and Liverpool spent big on a striker. Liverpool needed a midfield player, but the player that he wanted was not available. Now, you could argue, should they be going for somebody else? Yes, I think there is an argument that in possibly next season, Liverpool will need more than one midfielder. I think with the age of so and the injury problems of Thiago, uh, Jordan Henderson, I think, is injured now, is into his 30s. The same with Milner. Oxlade Chamberlain, I think, is going to move on. Naby Keita, I think, I'm sure. So Liverpool could possibly need two or three midfield players next season. So that that is the one area where you can question Liverpool. And that, yes, you're waiting for a particular player, and that's proved successful for Liverpool and not panicking. But I think Liverpool could be in the market for two or three midfield players next season. So I think the argument is, could they have maybe got one of those players right now? Now, whether Arthur Mello is that player, the fact they brought him in on loan shows they're not 100% convinced. But midfield is, is going to need a major, major shake-up in the next 12 months for Liverpool. Uh, Liverpool's old manager, Brendan Rodgers, Cara, having a tough time at Leicester at the minute, isn't he? Yeah, he is. Uh, you know, it's not been a great start for them. It's obviously been well documented that I don't think they've brought a player in. I thought they brought, maybe brought one player in uh, late uh, last night. And you think how good it was, certainly in the first couple of seasons, for Brendan, challenging for the top four, getting the FA Cup. Done a remarkable job. And I think if he is backed in the transfer market, uh, or if he had have been, I think he's proven his credentials at Leicester over the last few years, how good a manager he is. So... I think it's going to be a tough season for them. It's been a really tough start. And the problem is there's negativity around the club now, which doesn't help in terms of getting points on the board. But hopefully Brendan and you know, Leicester will be, will be up and running soon. If they've got too many good players to stay rooted to the bottom of the table. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Leicester lost to Manchester United last night, who've now won three in a row. And it's significantly strengthened their squad this transfer window. It's incredible, really, what a couple of weeks difference makes in the Premier League. With the sort of turnaround we've seen for Man United, what's the uh, minimum expectation for them now this season? Man United have to challenge for the top four. Uh, wh whether they will get there, we'll see. But the, the fact that they've had a little turnaround, you know, shows that, you know, they're never as far away as, as maybe even people like myself say after certain results. I mean, Man United should be challenging for the top four. Man United should be in the top four, but we realise the competition right now and you realise the job that Ten Hag's got to do. It's not easy. And that's why they've had to spend so big in the transfer market because the squad has proven not to be good enough over the last few years. And from their point of view, the players that they brought in, uh, you know, Martinez, I think Anthony, on uh, you know, from the attacking side of it, and Casemiro on midfield. So they've gone right through the spine of the team and really paid big bucks for every area of the team so that shows that you know the what was required and 
I think going forward, they have to be competitive in terms of the top four. And yes, it's a big job to turn around, but you think where maybe Tottenham were uh, 12 months ago when you know they were still had uh, Nuno Espirito Santo in charge near the bottom of the table, Conte comes in, and before you know it, we're talking about the fact that they could be one of the biggest challenges to City and Liverpool this season. So you're never far away as people think uh, when they're watching it, and two or three really good signings can really change that, and that's what they'll be hoping these signings that they've made in the summer will do. Chelsea have splashed out, Cara. I mean, they've spent more money than anyone's ever spent in a window ever, but we've been asking like, viewers to rate the transfer window out of 10. I've got to be honest, a lot of the Chelsea fans aren't that positive. Lots of sixes and sevens from Chelsea fans coming in. Uh, what do you make of the business? I mean, I suppose the one that's caught the eye is Aubameyang, Yang, but how do you think he'll get on? He's, he's a quality player. Uh, there's, there's no doubt about that, and I, I think it's a good signing. And people may question Arsenal's role in this, the fact that they let him go for free, and now you know Chelsea are paying money for him 12 months later. And uh, yeah, I think it's a good sign of a Chelsea, but I actually think it was the right decision from Mikel Arteta and Arsenal. Look where they are right now. Uh, Aubameyang, we know what he brings, goals and quality, but at times maybe situations and misdemeanors, maybe off the pitch or you know within the, the dressing room of the club. And, and Mikel Arteta couldn't stand for that. But Thomas Tuchel knows him. He knows him well. He's worked with him at Borussia Dortmund as well. And as a neutral, I'm delighted that he's in the Premier League. He's a brilliant player. You don't want to see players like that leave our league. So to get him back and the story now when he comes up against Arsenal, I'm sure we'll get our teeth into that. So, no, I think it's, it, it's a great deal for uh, Chelsea because the, the manager knows the player in it yeah. and you know his quality. Yeah. yeah, pretty sure it's November 5th that Chelsea play Arsenal, isn't it? So uh, extra sparks on bonfire night. Um, in terms of Thomas Tuchel, just how much pressure is now on him considering just how much the club have backed him and how much money they have spent? They, ha they have to deliver, don't they? Yes, but that's the name of the game for any, any top club. And that's always been the situation at Chelsea. It'd be interesting if it changes the fact that the, the ownership's changed because we knew how ruthless Roman Abramovich and, and his team were when managers didn't get off to a great start or didn't have a particularly good season. So it'll be interesting to see the relationship with, with the new owner and whether he goes about things differently. But for me, Thomas Tuchel's one of the top managers in Europe. I mean, he's a Champions League winner. He's won numerous trophies as well. And, and right now in the Premier League, it, it is tough to really compete with Liverpool and City over the last three or four years, no matter who you are. And Chelsea did need a, a rejig, certainly at centre-back with the players that they lost. So you can understand that they've had to go into the market. But there's no doubt they've paid big money for some of the players. You're talking about Liverpool and City being a long way ahead. I mean, with all the signings that have happened, do you think still those two are miles ahead? Do you think City have opened the gap? I mean, how, how does all the signings affect the title race this season, do you think? No, talking about those, those clubs in the last three or four years, not right now, it's too early in the season, but I still think City are at the same level. Liverpool have been a bit patchy to start the season, so in, in some ways they have to still prove themselves that they are a level above everybody this season. And those are the teams who haven't, haven't caught them up and closed the gap. Uh, yeah, there's still a long way to go. You'd expect Liverpool to uh, get back on track ASAP. Hopefully, fingers crossed, that's uh, Saturday at Goodison Park. But... No, I mean, Liverpool, no matter what you've done in the past, you still have to prove that you're the same team. And uh, at this moment, at the start of the season, Liverpool just look a little bit leggy, don't look them normal selves. But, as I said, it's still very early in the season. Yeah. Um, Jamie, I've got to ask your opinion on uh, all the business that Nottingham Forest have been doing. 21 new arrivals at Forest. I mean, mm -hmm. they almost had two full teams there, just missed out, actually, with, with the 22nd signing. Um, there's lots being made of that, and, and we've seen this before with newly promoted teams. And, and will signing so many new players be counterproductive, potentially, like we saw it was to Fulham a couple of years ago? Or can you understand the strategy? Well, 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 not all those signings can work. It's impossible. So, I mean, those players coming in, if you ask any manager, no one wants to bring 22 players in because it's hard to, you know, bring that squad together, create, you know, a bond and a spirit. And that's what Nottingham Forest are going to have to do to stay in the league. But what they've done is, I think that it will scare a lot of teams, uh, maybe teams who expect the three promoted teams to be fighting for their lives. And you'll actually look at the quality and the strength of squad Nottingham Forest have and whether they get injuries at certain times, they'll have almost direct replacements. The, the power they can bring from the bench, when you certainly with five substitutes now, and that's not normally what you associate with teams near the bottom of the league or promoted teams. So it'll be really interesting watching it going forward, whether they can create some dynamic and a togetherness, or, and that's offset maybe with the actual quality that they've, they've got on the squad and what they've bought now. But 
as I said, any manager, I'm sure Steve Cooper would say that in an ideal way, you don't want to bring that many players in because it's going to be really difficult and they haven't been there you know, throughout pre-season, so it'll be difficult for him to sort of get that team together. But we know the job he's done last season in terms of getting them up and they had to make a lot of signings anyway, the players that they lost, but, but 22 or 21 is certainly a big number. Uh, ask you about Brendan Rodgers before. I've got to ask you about your good mate, Stephen Gerrard, as well. You were top players together mm. on the field, great mates off the field as well. Um, a bit of a tough period for him at Aston Villa at the moment. Has he had the backing that he needed, do you think, to help get them up the table? I mean, they brought players in. Uh, I think he's probably brought seven or eight players in since he joined the club uh, in January, uh, the January window and this window. Listen, the... the Aston Villa right now have not got the, the, the funds of sort of, you know, the teams at the top end of the pitch, you know that, but then you look at sort of what someone like Nottingham Forest have spent, so in terms of teams around them, maybe they haven't spent sort of uh, those type of funds, but listen, Stevie knows that's part of management, you know, at times you've got a club where there's lots of money to spend, other times you have to wheel and deal, and, and he's at a club now where, you know, someone goes out, maybe like a Matt Target, you bring Luca Dean in, but that, that's the nature of the game, and, and as a manager, you have to basically get the best uh, out of what you've got uh, at your disposal. And there's some really good players at Aston Villa, there's no doubt. You know, the goalkeeper, the two full-backs, you know, Ramsey in midfield, Ollie Watkins up front. Uh, so there's some quality there, no doubt. And as I said, they're having a really tough time and a poor start to the season. And Stephen knows more than anyone, he'll have to turn that round quickly because we know the nature of the Premier League. So, uh, Jamie, we've done a whistle-stop tour around a lot of these Premier League clubs, but f for you, which <laughs> club has had the best window and who's the signing of this transfer window for you? I'd probably say Man City have had a really good window. Uh, you know, the players that they brought in, they lost a lot of attacking players, but you look at Haaland and Alvarez's start already looks real quality. Uh, and Haaland's done that jumps out at you. Uh, he just looks absolutely amazing. I'm doing the game on Saturday at, uh, at Villa Park, Aston Villa v uh, Man City, and I'm, I'm excited to watch any game, but sort of to watch him in the flesh and commentate on him for the first time and, and, and really get a good look at him, you know, off the ball as well. I'm, I'm really excited to watch him because I think we know we've got a great player in the league, uh, but I think we've got something really, really special that'll, you know, when he's finished his time at, at Man City or in the Premier League. We'll be talking alongside sort of Thierry Henry. I think this lad is could end up being you know the best player we've seen in the Premier League. I really do <coughs> believe that. I think he's, he's that special. He's made a brilliant start, and uh, I can't say long may that continue because that would just be a lie. <laughs> uh, but no, really excited to uh, to see him at the weekend. Brilliant, absolutely spot on, Jamie. We really appreciate you coming on this morning and uh, and sharing your thoughts on all of that. And enjoy the game at the weekend as well. Cheers. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, Hannah.